going on here? Hello? No. Yes, we can hear. Yes. Yes, you can you can start to that. Okay, so I was saying that um, this is this talk is about the interpretation of quantum mechanics, as uh, you gathered from Professor Lezenby's talk, and uh, this is very much uh, I in the interpretation of quantum mechanics I align very much with Einstein as opposed to Bohr, and that is very appropriate for this conference because this is dedicated to Professor Hestenes. And from my personal interaction with him and um, from his papers, I gather that he would rather side with Einstein too. So this is very appropriate. However, it seems that Professor Lesenby has completely destroyed my program because he has identified two central problems uh, of my work of last 14 years. As you can see, there are four, five papers here. So now I can happily retire and uh, live happily ever after. Uh, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, it is not as simple as that because I believe that um, I do not agree with uh, Professor Lezenby's equation two. And I also do not agree with uh, Professor Lesenby's counterexample in my Royal Society paper. So I will go through that. So um, the Bell problem, uh, you have uh, Alice and Bob measuring spins, and uh, you the uh, hidden variable, which is a terrible name, the correct name is the initial state or the common cause, which originates in the, uh, the values of the spins they determine are plus and minus. So sorry, the strong quantum correlation we observe in uh, um, in nature are international. Uh, sorry, I need to escape this. Uh, okay, so the idea is that uh, the strong quantum correlations we observe in nature are due to uh, the geometry and topology of uh, three-sphere, quaternionic three-sphere, as uh, Professor Lesenby mentioned before. And once you assume that, uh, the immediate consequence of that is that uh, uh, Searle-Sun's bounds is two square root of two rather than two that Bell predicted using local uh, realistic ideas. Um, since time is short, um, I just want to mention that uh, three sphere is an allowed topology uh, geometry from a uh, point of view of Einstein's general activity. It is well known that uh, S3 is as much allowed as uh, R3 uh, from the Einstein's equations and the current evidence than R3 uh, with 99% confidence level. Um, I'm not doing cosmology. Uh, I'm using geometry and on the on the lab at the terrestrial level. But I just wanted to mention that uh, this geometry is perfectly allowed by Einstein's equation. So the setup is this: I have defined uh, measurement functions uh, in the manner of Einstein. Uh, sorry, L, and it's a product of two bivectors. Uh, D is a detector bivector and L is the spin bivector. And same for Alice. Uh, and of course, their measurement directions are different. A and B are different. Uh, and these spin bivectors are related to detector bivectors uh, by only by the orientation of the uh, three sphere, S three sphere, uh, which I've termed lambda, which, is, which has value plus or minus one. Uh, once you assume this, and I'm I'm coming to the criticism by Professor Lezenby, but for the moment, if you assume this, then this, uh, the calculations of a correlation quantum mechanical, mechanical prediction is quite straightforward. 
and uh, that, uh, this is a matter of calculation. And this has been verified as I, the last line I say, this has been verified. Um, um, I just want to check, are you, are you able to still hear me? Yes. Excellent, good. So um, what I have calculated has been verified independently by several people. And actually one of the person who has verified this is sitting in the conference and he is one of the organizers. Um, uh, um, so what Professor Lezenby has argued is actually uh, rather academic, if not wrong, and I believe it's actually wrong. Uh, I do not agree with this equation number two that Professor Lezenby wrote down uh, on his slides. Uh, the equation with a plus sign in the just before the sum here, uh, and um, I do not agree with that and detector by, by vectors has meaning only of a relative orientation so uh, it, what changes is not the plus sign in the middle here but the order of the spin by vector with respect to the detector by vector and a detector by vector with respect to the spin by vector ellis and bob's uh, detectors the product changes the order that's the and uh, what uh, professor lesenby has done is just substitute the spin vector into detector vector, uh, algebra and vice versa and i think that is uh, of course mathematically possible but that is not the interpretation that i am i am promoting it's 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 a conceptually completely different setup than what professor lesenby has argued so that is my main point. Uh, what happens is the handedness relation is related by plus or minus. Uh, the spin by vectors, uh, you can write down in terms of basis by, uh, sorry, vector basis by vectors, but that doesn't change anything. Uh, you, can, you can start out with that. And in my paper, the Bertelmann Sox paper, I have done that with the vector basis as well. I should also mention that the issues that raised by Professor Lezenby has been answered extensively in, un in answer 13, 14, and 15 in the same paper, the Bertelmann Sox paper of mine, which is published in IEEE Access. So, uh, so the issues raised are discussed uh, at least for 10 years by me. Uh, um, so they are not new, they are not shocking or new to me. I have my way of dealing with them. Uh, of course, everybody is free wanted to say that I have a different point of view. Um, okay, I move on. Uh, I just want to give a, um, a, some pictorial understanding of what is going on also because the S3 remains closed under uh, product. Uh, sorry, yeah, uh, it remains closed under multiplication and therefore the uh, product of the spin measurements of Ellis and Bob also must occur in the same space and that has to be respected when you calculate the correlations and that is one of these uh, conceptual points that is very difficult to get across sometimes at least. Um, so, so this curve is the standard um, Bell theorem curve. The cosine correlations are quantum mechanical correlations, and the blue straight lines are supposed to be classical uh, Bell type classical uh, correlation. Uh, sorry, uh, Bell's local realistic type classical correlation. However, I, in my approach, this graph has a completely different interpretation. The cosine correlations are actually local realistic correlation within S3, whereas the dotted lines are within R3. So Bell theorem is not affected if you believe that you live in R3. And remember that all the experimentalists only use vector algebra in R3. They never bother to use anything else. So, uh, this is not something that should be 
brush us up, brushed aside without thinking. Right. I think um, that covers the first part, the Bertelmann Sox paper part of my um, uh, uh, singlet correlation only, the very simple correlations. And I'm rushing through because Professor Lenzenby has already explained things in detail, so I don't really need to explain them further, except our point of disagreement. Um, so I move on to now a, a greater, frame, a larger framework. The, the problem is that the three sphere, the geometry is not sufficient. Quaternionic geometry is not sufficient to understand all quantum correlations. Uh, one can understand, at least in my approach, that is. Um, uh, I can only explain the singlet correlations and the uh, correlation predicted, predicted by so-called Hardy state. Uh, Lucian Hardy's proposal of uh, state, which uh, can be also explained in three sphere. However, for more general correlations, for any arbitrary quantum state, three sphere is not enough. What, you, what we need is, is a seven sphere. And what seven sphere? Not the quaternion, in my approach, not the quaternion, sorry, not the octonionic seven sphere. The one, but the one that Professor Lesenby uh, criticized. So I will, I will get to that uh, now. The idea is that uh, three sphere is obtained by a one point compactification of R3. And we know that um, the algebraic representation of R3, the CL, uh, CL30, the standard um, uh, uh, geometric algebra. So the question is, what is the algebraic representation of S3? Uh, and we, we have, to, uh, I attempted to find that in a different way from the approach that Professor Lazenby has followed. Uh, so what the, the approach is 1D up approach, which is of course algebraically quite similar to what I'm doing, but conceptually I have done something very different from what Professor Lazenby, Lazenby has followed. Um, so what, what I'm doing here is simply an even subalgebra of the algebra CL40, which is 16 dimensional algebra. And um, it is not the 32 dimensional algebra that, um, as I understand, Professor Heston has proposed, but 16 dimensions that Professor Lazenby has followed and advocated. Uh, so now, I have given it a special name because this is a subalgebra, a eight-dimensional subalgebra of this algebra. Um, I, this is the relationship of various spaces, how I arrived at that. This is conceptually important for me, but probably not so important for um, other approaches. This is the multiplication table for this eight-dimensional algebra. One can, what is interesting here is that the signature here, if you see, it has six imaginaries, one, two, three, four, five, and six. In octonians, you have seven, seven imaginaries. So the last one in octonians would also be minus one. Whereas in here, there are six imaginaries and two plus ones. Okay, so um, now the question, um, the first thing to do is to consider a general element of that algebra. And uh, that element can be written as a, a sum over a quaternion, a quaternion, sorry. You can think of this as a, as a tensor product of a quaternion uh, times a split complex number. What is a split complex number? It's a complex number with um, this, Epsilon, which is just a pseudo-scalar, you see I3 here, is a pseudo-scalar, and which squares to plus one, and its conjugate or reverse is also the same. Uh, so it, it doesn't change the sign. Um, and this makes, uh, this makes the product of this general element uh, a split complex number. So it is, I say, like split complex number because it's not quite split complex number. A split complex number, the conjugation changes the sign in the middle, but in my case, or in the case of this uh, even subalgebra of CL40, 
the sign here does not change when you do the conjugation or reverse in the language of geometric algebra. Okay, so my claim is that the composition of norms holds for all elements in K uh, lambda, where lambda is the hidden variable or the orientation of the seventh sphere that we are going to talk about. Um, and this is a second claim that Professor Lesenby has challenged. However, it is a very straightforward calculation. Uh, and the, the reason, I, I'll get to the reason, but if you assume the norm to be defined as a geometric product between an arbitrary element of K lambda times its conjugate or a reverse, then it is completely straightforward calculation to show that the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this uh, equality, the first box, is exactly the same. It works out exactly the same, and this is the quantity. Uh, it is entirely a scalar quantity. So the, so the first parenthesis, first curly brackets is a scalar quantity. Second curly brackets is also a scalar quantity, but it has it is multiplied by an epsilon, which is the pseudo scalar. So this is again a split complex number, um, and because of this property, the norm relation holds for all elements of K lambda, despite what Professor Lesenby claimed, despite the fact that my paper was retracted by uh, communications in algebra and. Um, despite the fact that uh, people like Richard Gill has claimed that this, uh, this relation is wrong, despite the fact that uh, there were two years of battle um, disputing this relation on the um, discuss thread of my paper. They are all wrong. This relationship holds, anyone has to just sit down for half an hour to do the calculation and show that this relation holds for this uh, norm relation. Uh, and why, why does it hold? Because I have used geometric, algebra, uh, geometric product instead of a scalar product. We all know that geometric product is a more fundamental product in geometric algebra, not the scalar pro product or a wedge product. So I don't need to give lesson about geometric product to this audience. Okay, so now we come to the so-called counterexample by Richard Gill and uh, Anthony Lazenby. And this counter, uh, I suppose, I'm guessing that this counterexample may have convinced the communications of algebra to retract my paper. Anyway, so here we go. So if you assume um, these two elements, this is, this is the same as what uh, Professor Lazenby uh, assumed. Uh, um, so x equal to one plus zero scalar, y equal to one minus zero scalar, uh, scalar. One can calculate uh, using the scalar product uh, between z and z dagger. This is the de definition of norm. Um, then you can you get x equal to one and y equal to one, and so that the product of x and y is just one. So that's the right hand side is one. On the left hand side, however we have x, y norm is equal to zero. Again, um, sorry, uh, let me stress again that this is using the scalar product. So we do get zero equal to zero, not equal to one. And this is a straightforward contradiction. Uh, so what do we do with this? Well, let's use geometric product instead and see what happens. If you use a geometric product to calculate the norm, x norm is equal to one plus epsilon square root, y norm is one minus epsilon square root. You, you calculate the product x, y equal to zero. And we just saw that the left hand side is also zero. So left hand side equal to right hand side for all x, y belongs to the even subalgebra of the algebra CL40. This is a trivial fact. You can check it if you want. Um, okay. So what kind of a trick that I have used in my, my papers? Um, well, the reason this holds, as I mentioned before, and I completely agree with uh, Professor Lesenby that I have not spelled out all the details in my Royal Society paper. I, I apologize for that. When you write a paper, uh, 
like the one I wrote, my, my focus was entirely on the conceptual issues that I was preoccupied with. And I never realized what kind of issues in mathematics people would raise. I'm not a mathematician, I'm a physicist. And actually I couldn't care less about mathematics unless I have to, uh, if I don't have to use it. Um, right, um, so what is going on? Uh, the reason I am able to uh, uh, prove the norm relation for all K is because we know, uh, because it can be easily verify that the geometric product of uh, any element and its conjugate, conjugate gives a split concept, uh, something like split complex number. And that is the key. This one, at least one uh, expert on uh, octonionic algebra and algebra in general has, has agreed with me on this. So I have to say something. And that person, uh, I think he would mind if I mention his name, uh, is uh, Tavian Dre. I, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Trevin Dre from Oregon, United States. Um, so, uh, but one can consider, since this holds, this norm relation holds for all cases, one can consider a special case in which this uh, QR and QD, D, what are the QR and QD? Those are the two quaternions I have used to redefine or rather re-express re the general element. Uh, if they are orthogonal to each other, then we have a special case. And then this quantity here, which appeared on both sides of the non-relation, reduces a scalar quantity. And then we, can, we get a standard seven sphere of a scalar radius. Here, the radius is not scalar. Radius is a split quantum complex number. OK. So just to, to sum up, once you, have, once you agree with the mathematics that I have put forward, uh, it is completely straightforward to show that, um, well, not completely straightforward. It is, it is long and tedious calculation, but not that difficult. Um, that uh, a, a similar argument, like the argument I put forward with in case of um, singlet state can be generalized to arbitrary quantum mechanical state with A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all kinds of uh, experimentalists working together. Imagine uh, Alice and Bob and Charlie and uh, Derek and all kinds of people are trying to calculate correlations, then they would follow my prescription and they would find exactly the same correlations that are predicted by quantum mechanics. Um, the proof of this theorem is in my Royal Society paper. Uh, in addition to this proof, I have explicitly calculated uh, the singlet state again, the correlations from the singlet state again, and again, I have produced the right result, uh, the result predicted by quantum mechanics. And I have done for four particle state explicitly. Uh, remember, this is in addition to general theorem. And that also completely confirms with the prediction of quantum mechanics. And um, since there will, I assume there will be many questions, um, I can finish early. Hello? All right, Joy, thank you very much for yes. I have uh, many questions here. So please, Anthony, it's your turn. Okay. Joy, can you listen to us? Can you hear me? Yes, I can, yes. Okay. Um, so what you were showing in relation to the norm in the later mm -hmm. stages of uh, your talk, you have the yeah. square root of Q, Q reverse or Q, Q dagger. And of course, in doing that, you're not actually taking a, a norm. Uh, you, yeah. are, you are finding some new thing, which is not the norm. I agree. Uh, it is, it is, right. you, could, you could say that 
it is not the traditionally defined norm because we, <laughs> no, you immediately a priori assume a scalar quantity for norm. But why? We are working with geometric algebra. Yes, so, but can I just read to you, can I read to you equation 2.8 in your paper? Okay. Uh -huh. Equation 2.8, you define the norm of an object omega as the square root of the scalar part of omega omega dag dagger. So in your paper, you have got the correct definition of the norm, and then yeah. everything I say applies to it. Here you have a definition of some quantity, which is fine, but it's not the norm. So which do you want? Um, I, I want both. <laughs> um, okay, so as I said, uh, I do apologize that I didn't really uh -huh. write the Royal Society Bays in mathematics. However, uh, if you look uh, at the later part, when I actually do the calculation of this norm relation, equation 240, I do use uh, that, that orthogonality condition uh, that I just use here uh, on yes. this page. As you yes. Can, yes. Can I, can I ask so, about so, that? Okay. Can I ask about that special mm -hmm. condition? So we've agreed you've changed definition of the norm. Now you want to somehow get back to the definition of the norm that everyone else uses. And so yes. you put this condition, that's exactly the condition I said you had put, and which then means that you're just dealing, dealing with scale rotors, you're dealing with a subset of the space. Do you agree that setting that special condition reduces you to a subset, subset of the full space? Well, you see, this is something that I, I have difficulty uh, understanding. How can a special case, which just reduces the, uh, the way I imagine this is that you have a radius. This radius happens to be a, like a split complex number. So it has two parts. It has a scalar part plus a pseudo scalar part. You can see, if you can see this slide, you get to the very top, you can see that, right? Um, here I've written on the very top of this slide that a, a, a norm is a two-part quantity uh, in general, and that is a scalar part plus a pseudo-scalar part. Uh, are you able to see that? Uh, I can see uh, the equation. Yes, right. So what I'm saying is that uh, this is something that is not traditionally called a radius. I agree with that. Uh, no, uh, right. But, so we, but but, but, they, but I want to get you were, that radius, which I can. Yeah, you you are making claims about having a normed division algebra. The norm uh, in a that, normed division a algebra point. has to have a, just be a scalar, and your Q Z Q Z dagger. If you don't take a scalar part of it, it's got to just be a scalar anyway. That's of course why you're introducing this thing as a special case to try and get back to that. But yes. then that restricts the objects. For example, it eliminates the two objects that I was using and Richard Gill has been using as counterexamples. So you of course evade uh, the problems with those objects by restricting the set of elements to ones which do satisfy the rotor condition, which yeah, but, what you've written down yeah. here is the rotor condition. So but, that's, can you explain that any further? Yes, yes, I can. <laughs> um, well, I can only explain how, how my way of thinking this, uh, whether you accept that or not, it's a different matter. So my way of thinking is this, that I want to get the seventh sphere Seven sphere is, a, is the very last equation on the slide that is on right now. This, I think, um, this is a seven sphere, which is, I think everybody would be able to see because I'm, I put a dot in here so that the scalar pro product again. And if you use a scalar product, you end up with a scalar radius. Um, and and it, I haven't changed the dimensions. It is still the same eight dimensional vector which is dot producted with the its conjugate, and it gives me the um, scalar number, which is the radius of this seven sphere. Now, of course, uh, some it is a special case. So it is not the general um, eight dimensional algebra anymore, but there is no claim uh, uh, that it has to be the eight dimensional algebra, uh, full eight dimensional algebra. I, from that section onwards with the orthogonality condition, I move on to do calculations. 
So now that's fine. Claim so that, that somehow restricts. Yes, it has restricted it exactly. It has eliminated the problem uh, examples. Of course, you've just got rid of them because you're working with rotors, and that's fine. Now, as I said in my talk, if by working simply with rotors, that's enough for the later stages of the paper, very good. And then you can. We'll have to look at the later stages of the paper with that being the only thing used. But I think you'll understand that because you were, were claiming in the paper as published that uh, this was completely general and applied to the whole algebra and there were no special cases and indeed just now you've been denying those special cases you have to agree that in the end no you were wrong on that and you can throw that bit away and now we can just agree okay you're just working with scaled rotors is is that okay can we say that uh, no it's not no it's not okay ah. because um I, I mean i have used that restriction right from uh, let me just Yes, it's a question 2.4, uh, 2.54 in the in the Royal Society paper where I have actually imposed that uh, restriction. So um, I think the only and I'm sorry, yes, and at the same time, uh, we in equation 5.59, again, I have reproduced the norm relation for a special case. It holds, because it holds in general, it must hold in special case. Um, and it, so it does, you can see that immediately. Um, so, uh, yes, it's, uh, it could be restricting, restricting the algebra, which probably it is, but that's okay, because I'm working with this heaven sphere defined here in the later part of my 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 paper. Um, uh, okay, uh, that, that sounds fine. So we can agree from that to move forward. Yeah, perfect. yeah. right. So uh, it was very exciting, this uh, discussion. Just a, a, just a curiosity, uh, Joy. So uh, you came up with, with something that the pseudo scalar squares to one. So uh, it's similar to the double uh, or hyperbolic uh, quaternions? Yes, actually, yes. Uh, mm, yeah, uh, yes, I think so. I think because this is, this is, uh, uh, this is actually a tensor product of a quaternion with a, I hesitate to say split complex number because it's not quite split complex number. Um, so you could say it's a, it's a quaternion tensor product with C prime, if you like, where C is a complex prime, some new prime, new complex number. So yes, I think short answer is yes. Yes, so uh, in your papers, you shouldn't call them octonions because there are Cayley numbers and, and the pseudo scalar squares to minus one. While if it squares to one, better if you call uh, the, the double or, or hyperbolic, you know? Yeah, sure. Perhaps. I think so I the, don't, I don't, your I don't reviewers, know. Your reviewers perhaps uh, think in, in uh, Octonion or Kalil, Kalil Alvra. So then, then the, the, perhaps this is the confusion, you know? Yes, I agree. I right. Agree. So, okay. so but, but let me just make sure that you understand. I do not use Octonians. I call it Octonian-like. It's just okay. a different word. Yeah, don't use uh, Octonian. <laughs> don't use the word, don't use the word Octonian, right? Because I it's, it's quaternion, octonion, exenion, and so on. They're Cayley algebras. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. You know, uh, I, I was, we are very happy that you guys have somehow sorted out this problem, which is very difficult. So, yes. a lot of years, uh, people reviewing your papers, uh, 12, 12 reviewers for paper and so on. So, uh, thank you, uh, Joy. Let us thank the, yeah, the speaker. Yeah. Okay.